Thanks everyone and thanks B. And obviously thanks to the Socialist Workers Party to ask, invite me to speak at this meeting today. Uh, Jane Loftus, um, part of the Communication Workers Union, I'm from the postal side. Um, the elected chair of the postal constituency, the first ever woman to be elected in a male dominated area in terms of the industry. <laughs> Unfortunately, now going into my 13th year, so I've obviously done something wrong that I haven't <laughs> progressed further. But uh, yeah, and in that time, there's been a lot of change within the union structure. What I wanted to start from in terms of fighting austerity, uh, and I know a lot of you will have looked at the CW on Facebook, am I right? And we seem very active and lively and we're everywhere and here, here there and everywhere. Yes, we are, but no, we aren't in, a, in another way. Because social media can be a great inspirer, but also it doesn't actually give you the true facts of the reality of how do you build and how come, for me, the CWU are doing so well at the moment. And this is linked to the fight on austerity. Uh, industrially, and I know unions usually will separate industrial and political and say we do both together, but if you're not doing well industrially, it's very hard <laughs> to then do everything else politically to add on. Because you do only have one membership, and that's in the workplaces. So if you haven't got a confident membership that's not taking on industrial issues and standing up for themselves, it can then feed into what you can and can't do politically. So how you can push for Corbyn, if it's in argument in terms of Labour, etc. So why, in terms for me, on the postal side of the union, are we in such a good organised position? Well, our last campaign was around what we called the four pillars. Royal Mail, which is predominantly where the membership come from, was privatised. They were privatised with Labour not stopping it. And they could have done, I was, at a com I was at the conference where it could have all been rolled back, no, and it was Chukuru Muna at that time <laughs> who said no, Labour Party's policy is not for non-privatisation, so we got privatised. So you know you're not going to be under attack, we're under attack in the public sector as well, so you're going to be under attack here. And we knew the industry's changing, like life is changing. You know, and people talk about the gig economy, etc., and AI. Well, yes, there is a change from when I first started working 37 years ago in the post office. Everything was done manual, except a bit of sort and round a huge drum. Literally now, we can track and trace not only parcels, but the people who deliver them to you. And then it becomes that you have to, in reality, react to the situation that you're in. So we're going from a letters company to a parcels company, and this will probably bore you to death, <laughs> but actually it takes longer to deliver a parcel than it does to deliver a letter, very simplistic, but obviously the company still wants you to do that at a price that is equivalent to the cost of delivering a letter without the profit margins. So they've got to push down on us. So we were two years in the making of the campaign, and it wasn't that we weren't doing things, we were moving stuff along knowing where we were going to in the end. And we had four, pay, four pillars. And they were central to those pillars was the shorter working week. So we now have an agreement with Raw Mail that by 2021 we will be on 35 hours including meal reliefs and pay. Because we believe we've got to do that to secure full-time jobs. <coughs> and we even got them, if you join Royal Mail now as a full-time worker, you come in on that contract of 35 hours. So there's proof in the pudding that they want to do it, so we've done that. In terms of pensions, anyone sitting here with pensions, either you're too young and you'll tell you what the hell would have be bothered about a pension, or you reach a certain age and then you then realise, God, I wish I'd sorted my pension out. <laughs> right. And we, what, when we were going into dispute, and the one issue that we'd not really dealt with as a national union in terms of the localities was pensions. So using our young workers, got them all together, what it is, we had 40,000 
new starters in a different scheme to the old ones, to older people. So the inequality in the workplace comes in. And also the fact that you're not putting enough way anyway in your pension schemes are offering now, and that will be an issue when you want to retire, because everyone now is due to work till they drop dead. And that appears to be how it is. So we actually warn that we will introduce a new scheme, and it's going through legislation now, which will give you a wage in retirement. That means not a lump sum, you will get it, you will get it as a wage monthly. And also everyone will be back in the scheme together. So for the first time in a long time, on the fight around pensions, we're all in it together. And that was one of the priorities that we've done around it. So that's meant that we've been able to go out with the branches and the local reps, reju rejuvenate the rep structure, because we do have a legal agreement that we can have a rep in every workplace on every shift. Unfortunately, somehow, some branches don't like having a lot of reps or don't want other people meddling in their business, but it's there. And we've been going and filling those posts, bringing new people through, training them on the job, you know, to make sure that workers have a voice in their workplace. We still negotiate locally and, that, you know, you will have an impact. So we've trained our people, we've got them involved, we've got new people coming through. And that's because we've won a deal that people feel proud of and will defend because it's now under attack. But we knew it would come under attack because anything that you gain, they will always constantly come back and try and take it off you. And because of that work we've done, it's meant that when we've entered the political arena, we've got a wider audience who are getting involved. And I would use the anti-racism and the anti-fascism as an example of it. <clears throat> and others will cover national unions. Ours is very good. If we set our mind to something, we will do it, and it's very good. The trouble is we only tend to set our minds to do one thing at a time. So you pick stuff up and then you drop it. And the anti-fascism, anti-racism fight cannot be done like that. So when we turned up uh, for the uh, UN Day, we knew we were going to have loads there. We also knew other unions would be shocked to see what we got there, especially because it was white, working class, male, right? Now, looks good on one day, and we haven't supported another national one yet, but we will. But what happened from that, people went back to the branches, and during the, uh, the uh, MEP's elections and Tommy Robinson standing, we have got branches who are actively engaged now with Stand Up to Racism and it's part and part of their union work and they see it as that and that's one you can see if there's confidence in a workplace you can broaden out to other things that's why we can call and support Corbyn without being a huge backlash because we have with Labour they said they're going to uh, re-nationalise us and we'll keep them and hold them to it but there will be problems again about that because it will still come down to funding. It's not a panacea over, over everything. But what we need to do in terms to fight austerity is build that rank and file confidence in the workplace. We cannot, you know, you cannot bypass it by a leadership that just supports stuff. When there's no one in your workplace arguing on a day to day, uniting with people, working with people on loads of different areas and ideas. We do a lot of food bank collections and stuff like that, and people get involved in that. People do a lot over, they're doing a lot over menopause stuff at the moment, so we'll get involved in that. But it's engaging with your activists and your members and opening it up to them to come and join you in your local activities. And if you do it right, you can really do it well. I've been told that I've got the wind up me. But anyway. <laughs> right. But in terms of trade unionism and whether people should be in a union, I'm just going to do a poll straw here. Hands up if you're in a union. Turn your phone off. Anyway. <laughs> right. Down. Hands up if you're a student union. In the student union. Right, we've already got a few, hi to see you. Right, but what I was trying to demonstrate is, for most students of working class, they will have to have another job. And we tend to never, 
ever relate to young people saying join a union and that union will do you not only for your students but for your bar work for being a barista for doing yeah you know when you're doing the silver service and horse racing and all the rest that is what happens and that is where the unions have to look to you have to look to the young not only the ones in your workplace but the people who are going to come into workplaces so there should be no holds barred on where unions are organised. And that means us being in the localities, working with those people, giving them confidence, giving them the training to be able to do it. But in this particular time, that is what we need to fight austerity. The actual effects are not just socially, they're in your workplace. And if you can fight in your workplace, you then will fight in your society, in your community. And of all the fights in terms of what I think are main at the moment, you're industrial obviously, but it's got to be racism and fascism, and we now have to deal with climate change. How do we inspire workers to come out on strike for climate change? If we're really serious about it, how do we do it? And that means education, but confidence that they can do it, be and be protected and not end up sacked because of their actions. That means strong union organisation, which benefits for everyone. Thanks very much. This is a lesson on the, on the chaos of organising a panel meeting. Yes, while we're waiting for Ian, can people move along so that there are no seats spare in the middle? That makes it easier for the latecomers to grab a seat quickly and, and uh, the meeting will flow better. Thank you. I know you can't because you're doing that. Okay, thank you very much. So, the next speaker in our panel is Ian Hodson, who's president of the Makers Union. And again, Ian's going to speak for 10 minutes. Um, not very much. Obviously, the rolls between two forces. Normally, the other way around, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, always a pleasure to come to Marxism. Um, obviously, uh, this, this this is talk about austerity and the, the roles that we can play. Um, I mean, austerity creates poverty. Poverty creates low expectations. It ruins people's dreams. It takes away people's uh, hopes and aspirations. I mean, it's a deliberate. It's a deliberate, you know, uh, policy to to uh, to basically to create wage slavery. It's a deliberate policy uh, to force us into a position where we just accept uh, what's being done to us. And unfortunately, for the, for the last 40 years, uh, trade unions have, have basically, <coughs> instead of being a, a radical uh, force for change, we've started becoming a, 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 a an organisation that basically manages uh, decline. Uh, and we have to do something about that. Uh, because what we've seen, what we've seen in our, in our political system for the past four years, I know austerity allegedly only came in uh, in 2010, but if you go to the industrial towns and cities uh, outside of outside of London, what you'll find is the mining villages, for example, they've been going since they've been going through austerity since the 1980s. You know, I mean, the reality is, is although although the policy was only identified. Uh, in 2010, most working class communities up and down this country have been suffering austerity uh, for decades. You know, and, and it's deliberately designed that way. And what, what we have to recognise is what we can do about that and the importance of how we, how we react uh, to, to the issue of austerity and how we <coughs> deal with the problems that we face. Because obviously the problems that we face, I mean they're always very good aren't they at giving us champions. The, you know, the media and the establishment, they always give us, you know, they tell us who we should hate, they tell, tell us who, who's to blame for all the hardship in our lives. They, they say, you know, it used to be the unemployed, didn't it? We used to be unemployed a few years ago, obviously yeah. it was the unemployed. Uh, then it was the sick and the disabled, currently it's the migrants. You know, and obviously, so we get a hero called Tommy Robinson. Um, you know, obviously, uh, oh, it's just a Primark uh, Oswald Mosley, really, isn't it? That's, that's, all, that's, all, uh, that's all Tommy Robinson is. But, they're very good. I mean, and apparently he stands up for freedom of speech. Well, of course, unless you're a Muslim, you know, you know, if, unless you're obviously not white, you know. Um, I mean, the, the reality is, is they're very good at giving us, you know, champions. And what we, what we're very poor at is recognising that the champions are actually ourselves. And it's when we stand together we make a real difference. And, and what, what we're about to start doing now, as everybody will be aware about the fast food campaign and McStrike. Um, <coughs> I hope. 
Um, what, we're, what we're starting to do now is recognise that, that our strength comes from our communities. And what we have to do is engage with our community. So, so we're going to be going out, and we do go out currently, and say, and say to people, actually, who gave permission to these people to exploit us? Who gave these people the right to abuse us? Who gave these people you know, this, this opportunity to, to, to maximise their profit while, while minimising our opportunity to have a decent job and a decent home? Because it's them that's took it away from us, you know. Who gave them the right to do that? And our job is to ask. ask start asking that question. Who gave McDonald's? Who gave Starbucks? Who gave these companies the right to come into our communities and exploit us? Because when we start asking those questions, they're going to start coming up with what we have to do about it. And recognise that there are things we can do about it. Because the, the, the thing that we have to realise is we, the organisation of the working class is the key, is the key to our opportunities to improve our standard and improve our lives. When we recognise that, we recognise the power is in our hands, and we realise that we're better together than we are apart, then what we find is change can happen. And we know change can happen because we always see examples. The media won't tell you about it, but obviously you come to events like this and you go up and down the country. If you obviously the trade union, you might read it in your magazine about the victories that, that, that unions have that working class people do have. You know, they told us the McDonald's people couldn't go on strike. What did the McDonald's do? They went on strike. What did he do? They got the biggest ever pay increase that's ever been awarded of 6.5%. McDonald's in 1974 brought zero hours contracts in. When they went on that strike, well, they, when they announced that strike, McDonald's announced the rolling out contracts of employment. These things can happen when we take and challenge, when we challenge. And that's the key. That's the key. When, when we recognise that, and it's very important, and it's keep, uh, keep saying that, when we recognise our power lies together, that we can do more together than we'll ever do on our own, because they believe that because they constantly tell us, we will accept that idea that actually, if you're not, you, you, you're not strong unless you can stand on your own two feet. Well, actually, you know, actually, we're stronger when we stand together. We are stronger when we stand together. And it doesn't matter. You know, which part of the country you live in, you see it every day on your streets, you see all the homelessness, you see the despair. But we have to do something about that. Who gave these people the permission to come into our communities and do this to us? And what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? I mean, we can keep talking to one another. <coughs> I'm, 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 a quite, I'm quite a big believer, and I'm, I'm sure I'm in a room with people who also believe, is it one solution revolution? That's it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, 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 yeah. I, I'm a quite strong believer that we have to challenge back. Yeah. We have to stand up. You know, and if it takes strike action, so <coughs> be it. If it takes direct action, so be it. If we have to go and occupy people that exploit us, then so be it. Our duty is to support one another. Our duty is to make sure that these people who are living on our streets, we give them all the support that they need. When they push us, we have to join together and push back. Because that's how we win. And our history, I mean, I speak about it quite often. I mean, our history, our history demonstrates what happens when we, when we stand together and the changes that we make. And it's very important never to forget our history because they'll never tell us it. They'll tell us their history. They'll tell us the history that they want us to believe. They want, to believe, they want us to believe it's all, victories are always won by kings and queens. And they're not, you know, they're run by us, the working class communities of this country. We're very powerful people. We're very, very powerful when we realise that our strength lies in being together. We are, and it doesn't matter, by the way. I mean, I'm going to a freedom of movement rally tomorrow. I think the Labour movement's been very, very poor on freedom of movement. I mean, the idea that, that you know, that we, we, we can restrict people from coming into the country, you know, or tie it to a trade deal, that's wrong. Actually, it's a human right. The right to live where you want in the world. Who gave, who gave these people the right to determine how we live our lives. <coughs> Who gave them that right? And what we're going to do? We're going to take it back off them. That's our job. That's our duty. Hopefully I've cut time on some time for you before you show me the next piece of paper. Thank you very much. <laughs> Karen Reisman, who's a member of the Unison NEC, but is speaking in a personal capacity. <laughs> 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 Unison's a very strange union. Um,
want to start with the Tories because I think there is no doubt that this government are tearing themselves apart and there's no doubt at times that you can watch them and it's quite funny the viciousness that they have towards each other and the mess that they're in. However, whilst they are, and there is no doubt there is a massive crisis in the Tory party and in the ruling class over Brexit, but also over the economy and the direction and what they're doing, there are all sorts of difficulties for them, that I think that, that that doesn't mean that they haven't abandoned and they don't all share, whichever side of whatever argument they're on, they don't all share the desire to make us pay for whatever difficulties they have. And I remember Theresa May last year at this point saying that austerity was over. And I have to say I work in the health service and I haven't really noticed it going away. Um, somebody at our conference said that we've had the biggest drop in living standards for over 200 years. And I think that people do feel that. Not only only are we getting poorer, but actually we're expected to do two people's jobs for three quarters of a person's pay, and that gets worse and worse as, uh, as time goes on. And I think that it's easy to just passively watch the Tory government fall apart while they're attacking us. And I think one of the things that makes it easier for that passivity is the fact that our trade union leaders, and my union Unison is certainly guilty of this, has virtually abandoned the notion of having national strike action. The trade union laws make it really difficult because of their 40%, 50% uh, rules over how many people you have to get to vote. Um, almost impossible to get national ballots and therefore they have abandoned that despite the fact that nationally health services are being trashed in the same way as council workers, as postal workers, as people are being trashed nationally and yet we are being left to, to somehow deal with the consequences of those as trade unionists locally because they're not prepared to break the law. The Tories have been very, very clever over the years and realised that if you make the consequence of breaking the laws that the unions will get big fines and that threatens the legitimate and the wages and the lifestyle of the union leaders, they will fight tooth and nail to avoid you doing that. So we have a massive drop in living standards, and I think people are very, very angry about that. I think people do know we're the fifth richest country in the world. People do know that rich people are getting richer and they're getting poorer. I think when Jeremy Corbyn talks about the 99% being the people who pay the price, I think people identify with that. I think the danger is, even where you want to fight, I think the passivity of that lack of national action actually can affect people locally as well. Certainly, I think one of the things that was great was Corbyn being elected because it showed that people wanted socialist ideas within the Labour Party and the fact that he got re-elected the second time. But in a way, when you don't feel confident about fighting nationally, the idea of just let's wait for a Jeremy Corbyn election can actually sometimes feed the passivity that people have. And I think that sometimes that has happened. I mean, sadly, it's... Um, <coughs> I was at our national executive vote on Wednesday where they said that uh, they're not sure they want a general election at the moment because they're not sure that Labour can win it. And so our strategy really is to look at pushing for a referendum in order to get Brexit uh, um, dealt with and, uh, and out of the way. And in the meantime, we have to put up with Tory cuts whilst they're reshaping uh, the Labour Party. And I think some of us were quite horrified at the thought of them doing that. Uh, and I think that can be demoralising. Sometimes you look at what they say and what they do and what they leave you with, and I do think it can be demoralising, but there are lots of things that you can do. The first thing is I don't think you should abandon the notion of fighting for national strikes. And I think that numbers of people have, and I think that it's, we can still fight for national strike. I think some of the stuff that the PCS who got within a minuscule of actually getting a national strike illustrate that it is possible, even with the awful trade union laws. But also, if you get near to it, at some point, there's going to be a push where workers are going to say, sod the laws, we're going to walk out anyway. And I think if you abandon the push for it, I think that can be really dangerous. But I think the second thing to say is that there is still a lot of local strikes going on, some of which are in areas that you wouldn't necessarily think would be easy to organise. So you look at within Unison, some of the disputes, you know, Birmingham care workers, you know, barely have one place where they see each other from one week to the next, you know, go out and do individual work with individual clients, yeah, um, 
And I think, you know, you look at some of the NHS private contractors, not where you would imagine would be the easiest place to organise. You look at, you know, the, the Glasgow <coughs> equal, uh, equal Pay Claims. There are lots of disputes that are going on at the moment. Again, the PCS, the fact that they've got those disputes of, um, of some of the privatised cleaning strikes that started in universities and have now spread. I think in some of the sections that haven't been easy to organise in the past, you are beginning to see a real growth in, in local disputes, which can become infectious. In the NHS, the fight where they tried to set off sort of um, um, domestic and porters into <coughs> arm's length companies was looking like it was going full steam ahead and none of them would be in the NHS within a year or two. And it only took some solid striking from w Wigan who said, we are going on all out strike unless you, after the third lot of strikes, and the management thought, oh, sod this, and the council gave them some money and they're no longer an arm's length company. Has led to lots of other people fighting that where they haven't even got to the point of needing to go on strike. So there are those strikes and we have to make sure that we're offering solidarity because every word place that sent a message of support that got people to sign a card saying solidarity and did a little collection and then realised that they'd won makes you feel like when you're facing something that you don't like in your workplace, maybe you can do a Wigan maybe you can do um, a Red Department of Works and Pension maybe you can do some of the strikes that are going elsewhere, so it not only builds the confidence of the people on strike and it, but it also helps the people who are, uh, who are giving that solidarity to raise the possibility and when we win, and again, people sometimes think if you haven't won in the first day, that's it. I think the, the interesting thing about Birmingham and about sort of some of the other disputes is that it can actually take quite a long bit of strike and you can still win, I think is a lesson that we need to learn. And I think it is possible to organise those fights. There is nothing exceptional about Birmingham. There's nothing exceptional about the NHS disputes that we've had. I just think some, there's been somebody there who said we are not putting up with this and we are, do, uh, we are going ahead with it and I think we need to be a little bit more courageous about pushing locally to get more of those but I think the last thing I want to talk about is how some of the fights that are going on outside of workplaces actually we need to make sure are brought into workplaces and get some of the energy from them because there is undoubtedly true that if you look at the fights against racism, I'm from the North West where we, it's been quite difficult uh, and we've had all sorts of fights over the last sort of you know, five years against the EDL and people to actually see Tommy Robinson come with the absolute belief that he was going to win himself an MEP seat and we have had a fascist MEP in the North West before so this was not he needed 8% to win and there was a real possibility given the rise of racism. The fact that we managed to mobilise sort of people outside Outside and inside trade unions at work in order to, to everywhere he went using those networks I think helped at work to challenge the decisions that, that the racism that potentially can foster and grow and I think that's been really helpful to us to watch him go away with his tail between his legs um, is a very cheering and makes you feel like the rise of racism isn't inevitable the opposition to fascism is possible and I think that that helps people to feel again that, that what's going on but probably the best example is climate change where I think there is a real sense of school students have taken the lead and on probably the most serious thing facing all of us the people who are in the least good position have taken action and walked out of schools and done that but I, don't, I think the argument that you can take into workplaces about we can't leave it to school students right, uh, to, to fight that battle I think is one that does win support and the idea of getting trade unions to join with those school students again the Scottish region of Unison have committed themselves already to taking action on that day right across Scotland in solidarity solidarity with school students on the 20th of, uh, of September and at the National Executive encourage the union nationally to get the whole union to do that. Now Dave Prentice our leader fudged it and wouldn't say yes but he wouldn't say no either which I think is a reflection of how concerned they are about the mood that exists. And the last thing I want to say is something that I think both the other two speakers uh, talked about which is actually the lack of legitimacy th that this government has in order to force through their austerity <coughs> agenda and I think that lack of legitimacy is even more illegitimate when you have somebody like Boris Johnson not elected with I mean he promises sort of I mean, the midst between 63 and 90 billion pounds worth of promises which I think are as worth as much uh, as, uh, as the promise that he did on the back of the bus we're not going to see any of that money so don't be counting uh, 
counting it now. But I think that sense that he doesn't have legitimacy to what he does. I think you look at the, the, the amount of anger that Donald Trump generates because of his absolute blatant racism, sexism, anti-working class policies. I think Johnson generates those same policies. And I think the ability to be able to coordinate sort of uh, um, a response to that, both on the day when he's anointed, which is the 22nd of July, we should go for local protests, you know, at work, you know, uh, to represent, certainly in the public sector, we'd be mad not to. Uh, but it, at the um, Tory party conference on the, uh, on the 29th of uh, September, which I think potentially can be a very, very big demonstration to express people's opposition to everything that this Tory government have done so far and everything that Boris Johnson threatens, none of which is anything that we want.